And boom, we are back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winter. I'm here as always with Dr. Bear Paul Lando up here in the Six Rivers National Forest on the border of California and Oregon on this beautiful, pristine Smith River. It's a little ashy right now, but she's doing well. And um, we've been dealing with some forest fire as most of the West Coast has in the Western states. So forgive us for missing last week. We had uh, the amazing Kelly Brogan scheduled for last week's Al uh, Alpha Cast, and we had to reschedule. So we'll get Kelly on uh, probably on, an, hopefully, if she can do it on an upcoming Tuesday very soon here. In fact, Bear and I have been talking about upping the ante here, moving into the fall as uh, after harvest, since we'll have a little bit more time inside. And we're, we're planning on maybe doing two of these a week now. So um, exciting times because uh, we need to get. We have so much information we want to get out to everybody, and uh, we figure, uh, why not? Let's do two a week, huh, Bear? So we're working on that potentially, or maybe other, every other week doing a Tuesday special where we cover a specific topic. So, uh, but yeah, we will have Kelly back on. We'll, we'll have Kelly on um, on a makeup show very soon here, so look out for that. Today, we have an extremely special guest, Dr. Melissa Sell, to talk about Germanic New Medicine and um, chiropractic um, specialties and all sorts of wonderful topics. So this is gonna be a great show and um, we're really looking forward to it. Dr. Melissa Sell, uh, she began her health discovery journey in, in journey in 2005 right out of high school. She was raised in a typical family with mainstream views of health, but that all changed when she became a chiropractor assistant. She learned, <clears throat> she learned that the body is programmed for health and already equipped with everything necessary for healing. The revelation that a healthy spine supported by proper lifestyle led to her decision to attend chiropractic college while graduating at the top of her class. Dr. Melissa began studying the mind through meditation, self-study, and mentorship to more fully appreciate health as a product of self-understanding. She has shared her experience through online trainings to coach people through the journey of self-understanding with clients typically achieving amazing results. Melissa then discovered German New Medicine. GNM is a game changer, she states. It takes everything I love about chiropractic philosophy, innate wisdom, body's ability to heal itself, etc., and combines it with the supremacy of the mind and the science of evolution and embryology and delivers a complete understanding of how the body works to heal, what disease really is, and how to return to ideal function. She's a, she says, I'm eternal, eternally grateful for the work Dr. Hammer has done his legacy and his amazing discovery will live on through me. And wow, isn't that true? So wonderful to have you guys on today. Uh, Dr. Bear Paul Lando, it's, uh, we missed a week last week, which was a bummer. Uh, how's everything going up at the farm today? It's going good. Uh, kind of crazy, you know, we've got some sunshine actually, some rain on the way supposedly today. And I think we're out of the woods. Um, well, Melissa, so great to um, have you here. You know, I've been uh, wanting to talk to you for quite a while, and uh, you're one of the rare people that I've come across, especially in your age demographic, uh, young doctors that are interested in New German medicine. I started my journey in it, uh, I don't know, 20 some odd years ago, and, uh, you know, never looked back. It's the only uh, evidence based system of medicine I think we have on the planet. And uh, I believe that the next generation, which uh, means you, is going to take it to the next level. You know, I trained a lot with the masters, uh, you know, real icons over the years of different disciplines. I didn't uh, train with Dr. Hammer personally, but I trained with a couple of his people that knew him very well. But, um, you know, all the, the great innovators like Dr. Hammer, they always admonished, you know, not to just uh, follow completely in their footsteps, but to take it to the next level. In fact, that was the greatest honor that you could pay tribute, uh, you know, to their work in the first place. And uh, as typical in my experience, I've run across a few uh, of my early teachers that were more, um, uh, 
you know, uh, let's just say students of Dr. Hammer, and they would uh, kind of admonish me when I started introducing other things that, in fact, Dr. Hammer was doing at the end of his life, like uh, bringing in sonics as a possible solution to change, uh, you know, the, the electrical uh, dynamics of the conflicts that we talk about that I know you'll educate us about today. But anyway, uh, what I'm really looking forward to in New German Medicine and our discussion today is, you know, how do we take Take it to the next level. How we how do we make these concepts readily uh, amenable to the public that actually you know is so contrary to our mindset about how things work on this planet in the first place. So uh, great to have you here. Um, you know the the last uh, thing I want to mention. You know you and I were having a conversation about chiropractic and chiropractic. I, I did go to chiropractic college. I told you that I sort of got into it through the back door because after my conventional medicine career and then also uh, you know going through a four-year naturopathic college I didn't have a alternative license it was good in California because California was not licensing nature pass back in the 70s so I went to chiropractic college and used that license uh, for many years but in the process I found out a lot about chiropractic college and I was uh, absolutely impressed you know after being in schools like Stanford and and, you know, naturopathic college, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that much, to be honest, about chiropractic, but I found out that the core curriculum exceeds what uh, regular medics get. Um, you don't waste your time with just memorizing a lot of drugs. You fill up that space with a lot of good, you know, foundational training. And um, also something uh, that a lot of people are not aware of, back in the 70s, uh, the AMA, you know, through the back door, kind of approached the chiropractic profession. You tell me if you're aware of this, and said, "Hey, how would you like to be one of us?" They did that to osteopaths, and osteopaths took the bait, and in the process, they lost all traditional osteopathic training and the whole efficacy of their discipline. Now they're just kind of watered down medical schools, but they took it so they could be part of the fold. Whereas the chiropractic profession, when they got the same offer, they just basically told them to shove it. <laughs> and uh, that rankled a few feelings, of course. And it would also surprise a lot of people to know that chiropractors could be part of the AMA if they so choose uh, chose back then, uh, you know, but uh, respectfully declined. And uh, from that day on, also the chiropractic profession won a, um, a ruling against the American Medical Association, which stated that if you are ever saying anything deflammatory about the chiropractic profession, uh, or uh, its practices, and you would be the subject of a lawsuit and you will lose. So, um, you know, there's a lot that the public would probably be astonished by to understand more about the chiropractic profession, what could have been, and, you know, the reality of what chiropractic physicians really are. So, Melissa, uh, you take it away. Uh, there's all sorts of things I want to pick your brain about. And um, so uh, just give us a little idea about, uh, you know, how you got into all this. Yeah, that is, uh, I love that story. Um, I think so few people do know about it. And I always laugh anytime, especially on social media, when I refer to as a quack, it's like, did you know that you didn't even originate that idea, that the idea of chiropractors in particular, but alternative and holistic uh, doctors and practitioners being quacks, it literally was it was generated by the AMA. They had this committee on quackery. Uh, what you're referring to is like the this Sherman Antitrust Act that they violated and they got fined for it um, because they had the the plan to implant this into the, you know, into society that that alternative doctors are are quacks and that it's pseudoscience. And so people that that use that, they don't realize where it originated, which I find very funny. Um, but yeah, so I so right out of high school, I started working at a chiropractic office. I had no kind of prior, you know, knowledge of holistic uh, work, and I loved it. I was obsessed with it. I saw amazing things happen in the chiropractic office. I saw some just amazing role models, people exercising, eating healthy. It was just a whole world to, to be inside of, and I was like, oh, I love everything about this. And so that was, I was totally passionate about it and went to chiropractic school and loved it. I love also the, uh, the rich chiropractic philosophy was something that really attracted me, which is the innate intelligence of the body. You know, uh, BJ and Dee Dee Palmer wrote volumes upon volumes of really, you know, incredible and somewhat bizarre work of just 
uh, how the body works and how all of the the mechanisms and the tools that we use in in the world how you can see them within the body and so there's just such a reverence for the intelligence of the body within chiropractic that I was very drawn to. I had totally an awakening moment while reading one of the green books at one point, just by seeing the perfection, the perfection of the human body. Like the body is the greatest chemist. There's this beautiful story in one of um, BJ's books about the body being the greatest chemist. And here we have, you know, all these educated doctors and educated minds who think they know things about, about the body who can come in and tinker. And it's like this, my body made itself. My body created every single organ from scratch. It knows how to recreate it. It knows everything that needs to be balanced. And we come in and try to, to mess with the body as though we know something because we can take a snapshot and say, oh, this is causing this, this is causing that, we can remove this. And uh, it really resonated with me of like, wow, we do not revere the body and understand how it functions. And so chiropractic was just the, the, the perfect thing for me at the time because uh, it really focused on all that you can do rather than, you know, in the traditional uh, conventional model, it's all about the things that you can't do. You have broken genes and you're vulnerable and you're weak and exposed to germs and there's nothing you can do. And it truly is. It's the ideology of victimhood. It's like, well, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do to to get better, you know, it's just, I'm gonna have to take these drugs and have these surgeries. And you're very much just kind of a victim of circumstance. And I loved everything about um, the chiropractic world because it was like, no, and, and all the, the lifestyle interventions, it's like, no, I can, I can take control. I can eat different foods. I can exercise, I can take care of my spine, I can do all of this, this stuff to improve my health, to support my nervous system, um, to live. I love, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. James Chestnut, like a, a genetically congruent lifestyle was something I just, it really, really resonated with me. And then when I discovered GNM and the five biological laws, it just took it to the next level. Like I almost feel like the five biological laws and GNM are even more al aligned with chiropractic philosophy than even like chiropractic intervention itself in some ways, um, which some, some people may disagree with. But um, when you look at the work of Dr. Hammer and really see this um, this beautiful organization, all of the things that I even thought were mistakes because I did something wrong. So for example, you know, eating some foods that I shouldn't eat. And then I had this idea that certain foods like sugar, um, it paralyzes my immune system. It, it shuts down my immunity and then, you know, pathogenic bacteria or bugs can take over. And so it was kind of a, a negative cause and effect, like, well, I, I sinned and this is my punishment. <laughs> Whereas now with the five biological laws, and if you're brand new to this, congratulations, this is going to be really fun. Um, we're seeing the deliberate intentional adaptation of the body where when we develop symptoms, when we develop you know, something that we would previously call sickness, when you understand the language of the body and you work backwards from the symptom, you start to see, oh, there, there was never a mistake here. You didn't do something wrong and you're being punished biologically for eating bad foods or doing something wrong. Really, it was a, it's a complete biological program that is innately installed into your human software and that when we encounter and experience certain shocking situations, our bodies are not just sitting by saying, oh, I hope you can handle this. I hope you can handle this death right conflict or this, um, you know, you're feeling too slow or there's an indigestible morsel, good luck. Realizing that your body is 100% on your side, constantly detecting things in your environment to see, is there something that I can do to step in and adapt the physical tissues of the body in order for you to survive this situation? Um, and so it was uh, when I discovered GNM and the, and the five biological laws, it just was, it blew my mind because um, it, it takes it, it's very nuanced is, is something about GNM that I find um, it's very easy to just brush over and, you know, look at, oh, mind body. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But when you really understand like the deep interconnectedness of the biological laws of the organization of the body, of the germ layers, of the embryology component, I mean, I don't even know where to, where should we begin? <laughs> Yeah, what, what really delighted me about my first exposure to new German medicine, because back then I was already into advanced uh, techniques in radiesthesia I learned in Europe, you know, that uh, can discern waveforms and, and all being the product of our own consciousness, our own thought processes. And so Dr. Hammer was the first one that kind of made that 
not just a mind-body connection, but to understand that the body is a holographic representation of our psyche. And in fact, a gift to the human species that allows us to have an evolutionary tool in the body itself to raise our consciousness beyond reactionary animal to consciously rational human even, uh, you know, even though the appearances in the outer world are contrary these days, but we do have that option compared to the uh, animal kingdom. And what we think of as disease are actually holographic representations of those instinctual programs that then the body on our behalf allows us to outgrow those and, and not only live healthy in the physical body, but also to uh, evolve our consciousness into greater awareness. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I think it'd be fun to go through the five biological laws to give people like a fuller uh, picture of what we're working with here. So um, Dr. Hammer's story just briefly um, was that he had a shocking trauma. He lost his 17-year-old son to a gunshot wound and several months after that loss, he developed testicular cancer and he started thinking about Okay, I was healthy. There was nothing that went on. And, you know, there's no reason, no familial reason, no genetic reason that I should be experiencing this cancer. And so he started interviewing cancer patients and saw specific themes that people who developed cancer had some type of shocking trauma. Something happened to them that caught them off guard that was unexpected. And beyond that, beyond just, again, the, the stress component of a, a lot of different thought um, ways of thinking have seen the connection between stress and disease, but he took it a step further and really looked at the de detailed connections of the type of stress, the specific type of trauma that the person experienced and the specific type of cancer. So with this, uh, this testicular cancer he developed, he found that this is specifically related to some type of loss conflict is associated with the testicles. Uh, with breast cancer, it's either a nest worry conflict or a separation conflict. And he found that each different type of tissue, you know, because the, the skin of the breast gland is different than the, the, the tissue or the, the tissue rather of the breast gland is different than the tissue of the breast duct. They derive from different embryological germ layers and they respond to different types of conflicts. So this is where we're getting into this very detailed organization of understanding the origin. So I, I love the word um, ontological. So each of the biological laws, one of them is the ontological system. And that means understanding the origin, understanding where did this tissue come from? How did this tissue originate? Where in, you know, in the development of human beings, when did this tissue become differentiated and start functioning in this specific manner? Um, so that is a, is a very cool thing. And if you feel intimidated by, you know, things like embryology, there are very simple ways of understanding GNM. And I really do encourage every individual because this is so basic. It's you getting in tune with your body. It's understanding your apparatus. It's understanding this kind of ancient equipment <laughs> that you came, you came here with. Um, we have these very you know, new minds and we can think about tons of concepts, but if you are disconnected from this kind of ancient biology and the way that it functions, you can, you know, it, there's, it's, it, things get lost in translation. So we can be thinking with our cerebral cortexes and imagining up all of this stuff. But if you're unaware of how that is communicating with your kind of ancient tissues, you can be sending all sorts of messages of danger, of I'm not okay, when there's not an actual physical threat in your environment. And so that is, you know, realizing that all of these adaptations, they are meant for your survival. So basically, if you think about all your senses, all of your nervous system, it's like this signal detection device and it's constantly scanning your environment for safety. Like, am I okay? Is, is, is something gonna come and get me? You know, because survival is, it's first and foremost. Think of like a small animal that is, what is it doing? It's constantly looking. You know, we've got these cute little chipmunks that are, that run up and across our, our deck and we watch them and they're just so jumpy and any any movement, anything, anybody moves, any like the dog scratches them and the, the chipmunks run away or the birds, they, they, they fly away because they're constantly trying to survive. And we have the luxury of not having to constantly, you know, watch out for our survival. You know, we have, we live in this world where we're relatively safe. Um, and so our psyche and our nervous system is just constantly looking out. And the moment that we detect something 
And this is, you know, they've done those cool studies where, you know, your nervous system picks up on potential dangers before your conscious mind is even aware, um, which is, you know, Dr. Hammer is very specific about referring to these, uh, these conflicts as biological, not psychological. So these are like programmed, almost like reflexes, programmed into your body, not necessarily something that, you know, is, is just going on in the mind. So the, it's all in your head, really, it's, it's all in your biology. And so the first biological law is the connection between the psyche, brain, and organ. And so like the moment that your nervous system picks up on something that sufficiently catches you off guard, which is one of the key components of a conflict shock, rather than just general stress, you know, general stress, we, you know, things that you can predict, things that you know are going to happen. Uh, general stress doesn't trigger the biological program. It is something that is sufficiently uh, shocking, that catches you off guard, and that in that moment, your psyche, brain, and organ simultaneously sets off this biological program. So it's like this cascade of as soon as your body detects it, depending on the content, depending on the type of situation that you're in, whether it's a death fright, whether it is, you know, you're feeling stuck, you're feeling frozen in fear, whether you are, there's a territorial fear or a separation conflict or a self-devaluation or an indigestible morsel, depending on the content, of the conflict that you're experiencing, a specific cascade of events is set off. Your brain is impacted, you know, Dr. Hammer, um, and again, this kind of brings in this, uh, this nervous system component. He knows everything's controlled and directed from the brain, which is also a very much a, a chiropractic um, principle and understanding that the brain control is running the show. Everything starts in the brain. And so Dr. Hammer, he looked in the brain to see, you know, is there anything going on in there that we can see that could help us to know exactly how these biological programs are unfolding. And he did brain scans, CT brain scans, and found consistently across the board, everyone that had a certain type of physical manifestation, so like a physical cancer, like a tumor, had an impact in a very specific area of the brain, the same area for the same cancer. And he drew that back to a specific shock. So that's the psyche, brain, and organ specific type of shock, something catches you off guard of a, a certain nature, the brain automatically knows what tissue needs to be adapted for your greatest survival in that specific situation. And so we have that conflict, the brain's impacted, and then immediately the organ starts to adapt. And so the, the way the organ adapts will depend on the type of organ that it is, the type of tissue that it's derived from. Some organs will adapt by increasing cells. And so an example of this would be the lung alveoli um, within the, the, the digestive system, glands. And so we want to increase the, the cells to produce either more um, digestive juices, more um, enzymes or saliva, or in the lungs, we want to be able to absorb more oxygen. And so Again, it's very detailed and it's very specific to help you through whatever the shocking situation is. And the adaptation will occur, and this kind of gets into um, the, the next biological law, which is the law of two phases, where we're understanding that the body normally is in this normal day-night rhythm. We normally are in homeostasis. So during the day, our bodies are more sympathetic active. During the evening, we're more parasympathetic, rest and digest. And then the moment that you have this shocking trauma, you're caught off guard, there is consistent tissue adaptation. Every moment that you're in this trauma, in this shock, in this conflict active stage, your body's like, all right, let's do what we need to do. Let's increase these cells. In some situations, we're decreasing the cells to widen ducts so more fluid can flow through. Um, so there's this very specific thing that's taking place until the moment the conflict is resolved, which is when the body starts setting things back to normal. And so your body has this plan. We build up cells um, during the conflict. Once you resolve the conflict, the body then breaks those cells down using bacteria, which is incredible. Um, another thing that Dr. Hammer that's so relevant right now, which is the fourth biological law, is knowing that your body has a plan to set you back to normal. The adaptation has a plan and a program for decomposing the additional cells that were built up and the body uses something like tubercular bacteria, candida, fungus, um, to break down additional cells. And so we're, we're starting to get this full picture of that what the body's doing is very specific, it's on purpose, and it's in response to something you experience. So I don't know if there's anywhere you want to jump in here. <laughs> 
Now that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, the five biological laws should be taught in every medical school of every type, without exception. Uh, you'd learn more, and uh, doctors would learn more from that little um, dissertation that you gave. You know, in a few moments in all four years of school, I think. You know, the the difficulty that I found over the years when you're talking to people with conditions, and you know, you're using the terminology of new German medicine which has to do with kind of survival phrases like territorial conflict, morsel digestion conflict. You know, it's like, what the heck does that mean? Well, these are things that are very understandable when you think about them, uh, you know, relating to the animal kingdom. But then, you know, of course, humans, we have more of a complex societal structure and, and you know, indirect ways of interacting with the environment and ourselves. So we have to uh, learn how to extrapolate how maybe an issue that would create a survival situation in the wilds for like a wolf would translate into a real human experience, like somebody who just lost a mate or, you know, lost a job or just was insulted, you know, in passing by somebody that they don't even know. And um, so, yeah, uh, I, I have a lot of areas I want to get into, but I want to hear you. So any response to that and how you deal with that with your clients? Yeah, and that's the, the, the best thing about GNM is the fact that it is um, empirically verifiable, that it is about your experience. Like your personal experience is absolutely the, the king of all <laughs> and that you can test these out. This is not something you have to take anybody's word for and you, and you do have to do a bit of translation. It's like, okay, so what does that mean for me? How did I experience this situation? How, you know, one of my very first experiences experiences with seeing GNM in action after having learned it was I was eating some food at a family member's house and they, you know, it was these meatballs and I took a bite of it and I was in a, a crowd of people and I hated the way the texture of this meatball. And I was like, I wanted to spit it out so bad, but it was like, I couldn't do that. So I just gulped it down and it was, it was horrible in the moments that I was, you know, experiencing. But after that, I had a terrible sore throat. My, my voice started getting really scratchy and I was like, my throat was swollen. I was like, oh my gosh, I had a conflict. And it was very early on in my, my GNM. And so I looked it up and I was like, oh my goodness, this is a can't swallow conflict. And so it either has to do with me not being able, not wanting, not being able to swallow something or wanting to spit something out and affected the upper two thirds of my esophagus. And so in those moments when I was kind of panicking and like being grossed out by this thing that I was consuming and not wanting to eat it, but eating it anyways, my body was like, she needs help <laughs> because I was caught off guard by eating this thing. I didn't realize I wasn't going to want to eat it. And I didn't realize I was going to have this moment of, I uh, can't really spit this out. And so my body stepped in to help me. I was caught off guard. That was the, uh, the way that I was affected. The upper th two thirds of the esophagus, what happens in this particular biological program is erosion. So this is um, controlled by the cerebral cortex. There's erosion or widening of the, um, the surface mucosa to widen the throat, to make it easier for the thing to get down or for the thing to get up. It was very purposeful what was happening and it was sufficiently intense. It was a pretty intense you know, couple of seconds where I was dealing with this. And then after I resolved the conflict, after I got out of the situation, my body's like, okay, she's all right. Now the body steps in and starts repairing that tissue. And that's when you experience symptoms. It's after the resolution when uh, I've got inflammation, when I'm trying to swallow and I can kind of feel my throat touching because it's inflamed and my voice is scratchy. After that, it actually, I had like a cough from all of the, you know, the exudate when your body is healing and restoring tissue, there's a lot of construction that's happening in that place. So you're going to be coughing stuff up. And previously, I would have, you know, not attributed that to this shocking situation. I would have thought, oh, I must have eaten something and my immune system must not have been able to fight off the bugs. And now the bugs, the pathogens have taken over. And I would have thought of it in, in that way. But now seeing there was never anything wrong. My body just interpreted my experience in its own biological way and stepped in to help me. And so that was my can't swallow conflict. And that was so, that taught me more than reading all of the books and reading the, you know, reading the whole chart. It was like, whoa, 
that's how this works. You know, I learned a lot also from, from acne breakouts and realizing that I used to think um, that, you know, once I learned about bad oils and, you know, the oils they use at, at restaurants and how they're rancid, I, I had it in my head, oh, these rancid oils, they cause acne breakouts for me. And so every single time I would go out to eat, I had this thing in my mind that the bad oil causes inflammation. It causes uh, me to have a breakout. And so I'd never, I could never eat out or, you know, I'd have to tell, ask them to, to cook in, in butter or something specific when I'd go out to eat. But once I learned the GNM understanding, which is that um, the, the dermis, the corium skin, responds to a feeling attacked or feeling soiled conflict, and that um, acne is the result of feeling attacked or feeling soiled. I was like, okay, so I feel soiled every time I consume this food. Therefore, I break out around my mouth in when I have, when I eat out at restaurants, when I have this concept. And when you take away the concept, you stop having the breakout. And I was like, whoa, this is so interesting. So it really, you know, it, it took my nutritional understandings to a, a very new perspective. And it's not that I don't believe that eating well and eating clean isn't important because I very much think that it is. I think we should be eating as close to nature as possible because again, that's the most genetically congruent, but I don't any longer think that bad foods cause disease or cause problems in the body. And that's one of the things I really, really love helping people to do is to break free from uh, like really strict dietary um, restrictions because a lot of people have cut out so many foods because they believe certain things that the foods are causing problems. And if you start seeing that, you know, your body, when you are in conflict, it takes a snapshot of everything in your environment, including foods, including chemicals and substances. And so, you know, this, the development of allergies or intolerances may not be because of the actual, just the physical matter, but it has to do with you and what was going on with you at the time. And you can have a conflict get tied to a food and that when you can untie the two, you know, you can be free to eat the food again. And so that is really fun for me is to, to help people to do that because so many people are, they're, they're having conflicts. They're having, I can't swallow conflicts um, over the fact that they're eating foods they don't want to eat, not eating foods they, they, they want to eat. And so that is, that's a really fun thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's, Go ahead, Michael. Well, I just had a quick question on um, something that I challenged with because I'm still learning this. I'm kind of like the audience here listening. I'm, I'm really learning a lot about new German medicine still, but where does the line draw between transmuting with mental power, your ability to stay healthy versus just like eating McDonald's all day? Like people are just oblivious. If they don't have conflicts eating McDonald's, and I'm playing devil's advocate right now, okay? So let's say you don't have a conflict because you're just kind of oblivious that McDonald's is poison <laughs> and or whatever, any fast food, right? GMO, garbage food. And uh, you're just one of those oblivious people who just, you know, ingest that and you don't have a, you know, a known conflict with it because you think it's great but you're still now suffering from uh, diabetes or, um, you know, these chronic illnesses that we know, you know, extreme inflammation, et cetera. Where does that line draw between where the Germanic new medicine kind of, you know, relates that mental concept of conflict to the actual physical um, reality of, of the toxicity of, of food? Well, have you ever known of someone who ate all the wrong things and smoked and drank and did everything wrong, but they're, you know, healthy as a horse and they live to a ripe old age. And so this, I really feel like GNM helps to under, helps us to understand that because that was something that baffled me and really kind of disturbed me for a while within the lifestyle based chiropractic world that I was in, because I was, you know, under the impression that doing the right thing, eating the clean foods, you know, clearing out the toxins, you know, doing all of that stuff was going to safeguard you from disease. And um, in this organization I was, I was a member of, Every so often there would be a person who's kind of like a pillar of, of all things healthy uh, and they'd get some kind of diagnosis. And it was like, it yeah. was shocking. It was really, really hard to wrap my mind around because it was like, okay, all this stuff I'm teaching, I'm telling people you're not going to develop cancer. You're not going to develop these diseases if you do these things. Yet here's, it was very difficult. And so seeing that, um, 
what we're calling disease, something like cancer, when you think of it, again, as a result of toxic accumulation and bad foods and, um, you know, all of this stuff going wrong in the body, interrupting, interfering, um, when you see that, it's actually intentional adaptation, that you could be the healthiest person in the world. You could eat all the right foods, be doing all the best stuff, the cleanest water, all the, the wonderful things. And if you have a certain type of conflict shock, you will still develop cancer. And that is not a bad thing. It is not an error. You didn't mess up. It wasn't from toxins years ago. It wasn't from something random. It was a very specific and intentional adaptation. And so you're really in this model, you think about everything different. You think about cancer different. You think about diabetes differently. And, you know, and it's when a person heals or gets better after doing some type of intervention. So some type of radical dietary makeover and they, they are detoxing and doing all sorts of stuff that didn't happen in a vacuum. It wasn't just about the material that they were consuming or the material they were detoxing from what was going on in their psyche. They were resolving a conflict in order to heal. The conflict has to be resolved. And so that is, again, it's helping people to get free from this next intervention, the next thing I'm going to do. And, and this is something that makes me love GNM, you know, more than anything else is because it really does bring us back to the supremacy of the psyche, the individual, the mind, and knowing that, you know, all things like within an organism can be transmuted. Everything, um, if I'm at ease, if I'm at peace, if I am calm, if I am in homeostasis, I believe that my body can handle absolutely anything. Um, something that I'm seeing a lot of, it's just kind of interesting is, you know, like the terrain theory. Um, but a lot of people I'm seeing in the terrain theory model, they, they're not necessarily totally on board with GNM and they see everything as about being about toxins and it's just, it's the toxins and this is the body detoxing and this symptom is detox and this is, and it's all detox. Um, and I think that that does, it gives so much power to the toxin. It gives so much yeah. power to the external entity. And I'm all about taking my power away from all external entities and taking it all um, internally. And something that I love, and I'd love to get here in our conversation, if you guys are interested in going there, is the, you know, like the, the Walter Russell stuff and the, you know, the, the knowing that everything comes down, it's, you know, to light, it all comes down to one thing and that everything can be transmuted. And there is nothing external to me, nothing that can harm me when I'm at ease and at peace. And so realizing that my organismic history, realizing this kind of spiritual truth of balance, of oneness, of nothing can harm me, no external substance, no chemical has that power over me. Um, it changes everything. It really, really changes yeah. everything. So I think that it does take some time to get there, to kind of really see the difference between, okay, well, I personally, I don't eat McDonald's. I don't eat crap food. I, I, I do everything as clean as I ever did. But I also uh, realized that if I were to come into contact with something, I would not make it a big deal. I would be able to balance and transmute whatever that thing I came into contact with um, was. Yeah. Well, my, so I have an aunt Dorothy, she lived to 105. She drank uh, her scotch every night, smoked her whole life, but she was always so content in life, was always beaming with, with just vitality, um, was a socialite. And she, uh, when she went, she just went, she went to sleep. And Bear and I have talked about this a lot. Like when she, when she decided to leave this realm, she just went to sleep and she just was gone. And, um, you know, my mother, I love her to death. And I always get concerned that she loves her chocolate and she loves her McDonald's. And, um, you know, we're always on her. You got to change your diet. But guess what? She is always happy. She's always, you know, transmuting reality in her own way because she has got a vitality and love for life. That's so amazing. And I think this is a really good um, wake up call to a lot of us in the alternative health community, because you're right. We do get so focused on, well, we we claim that we're not focused like with the germ theory thing, like germs are bad, but then you're saying on the flip side, toxins are bad. So we're literally making toxins like the new, the new germ in a way, you know? So it's, it's um, we're back right in that same box again of materialism. So um, that's a really, a really cool thing that you brought up there. And also the Walter Russell connection, of course, I'm sure Bear yeah. could expound on that for a million years. Well, Melissa, as a biotrain specialist, you know, and I trained with the old German school, like way back and, you know, it's totally indoctrinated into that school. Uh, I agree with you 100%. I still uh, am a proponent of bioterrain medicine, 
but uh, for a long time, I left behind the whole notion that, uh, you know, these things like toxins and things are actually what making you sick. And I think the biggest takeaway with New German medicine is that uh, what we term as disease is actually the cure. And of course, like everything else in our reality, it's been 100% inverted. So if we really want the truth, we don't even need training. All we have to do is uh, ponder the opposite and you'll probably be pretty close to the truth. So, uh, you know, it just turns on its head, the whole concept of disease period. Uh, Bioterrain medicine to me now is, um, you know, let's just say you have that person that eats at McDonald's and does all these things. That doesn't mean they're going to get sick. I'm in total agreement. However, if they have a conflict and now they have a process triggered, the body still needs certain resources, including microbes in the right place in order to run the full biological program uh, full circle so that the person regains their health. So that's where I see biotrain medicine now uh, as far as within the context of um, new German medicine, you know, rather than looking at the terrain is what's making you sick or healthy. It's like, well, let's manage the terrain in the event of a biological program and to make sure that the person has all the resources they need so they don't get caught on what I just termed an uncomfortable biological plateau where things keep growing or deteriorating, whatever the conflict is, uh, you know, that's, that's producing a biological event. Uh, so that we don't get a hanging conflict, as, as we would call it. You know, the, uh, I, I wanted to make a, a, a bunch of comments because there's, there's just it's so wonderful talking to you today. I, I don't get this opportunity uh, amongst colleagues to talk about new German medicine because nobody even knows about it, let alone schooled in it. So this is uh, great. But new German medicine is absolutely brilliant. And I think this is very um, relevant right now because it explains uh, – pandemics, for instance. Uh, let's just take an ex We could uh, talk about Spanish flu. We could talk about all sorts of things. Um, let's go back uh, <laughs> maybe to World War I and everybody sending their uh, you know, loved ones off to war and uh, you know, moms are fearing for their kids and kids themselves are fearing for their lives. And in New German medicine, that could create what we call a, a, a death fright, which is going to be uh, played out biologically on our behalf to dispel the pressure that creates with that conflict in our psyche. Uh, the biology is going to play that out in the lungs because we're only as good as our next breath. So a death fright, you know, if people think they're really, their death is imminent, then, you know, the lungs are, are represent that ability to stay alive moment to moment. So uh, sure enough, people started uh, growing things in their lungs, you know, masses in their lungs in order to biologically buffer the, the psyche from this so-called death fright and play it out. Uh, but then what really took note, because we didn't have early detection, early treatment back then, was in the aftermath, everybody starts spitting up blood and pieces of lung tissue and everything. And oh my God, we culture this and we find a tuberculosis organisms in here. So now we have an outbreak of tuberculosis. But what people don't understand is that tissue uh, works symbiotically with uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, organisms and when the biological conflict is going full circle and the growth is no longer necessary then these TB organisms go in there gobble up the tissue and if you know what's going on then you like the wealthy people in World War One used to go to the sanitarium to, you know in the mountains of Europe and just get better whereas the, the regular folks that didn't have that advantage you know got you know got sick from it so, uh, so anyway, yeah, just so we had our first massive outbreak of TB, which in fact wasn't TB at all. It was created by these other events. And uh, just to spin off, I really want to get into the Walter Russell stuff more than anything. But uh, so my question to you, though, is um, in light of the, um, the Cerveza virus out there, uh, do you see any... Uh, things within uh, new German medicine that could perhaps explain what's going on with that right now? Yeah, well, the, the symptoms being, what, a, a fever and a pretty dry cough um, has to do with the, the bronchial lining, the bronchial mucosa, and that's a territorial fear conflict. And, you know, as far as what could trigger a territorial fear, fear of germs, fear of sickness, fear 
um, any kind of a fear in your environment, you know, there, if you look back at like the whole Wuhan thing, there was an incinerator that was being built that the people were against. And so that very easily could have been a territorial fear that multiple people were experiencing simultaneously that resolved for whatever reason. So whether it was because they realized, uh, you know, that <laughs> them rejecting this was, was futile and they kind of gave up, or if, you know, I'm not sure the specifics, but that's the thing is like, it's so individual. And, and in any situation, look back at any plague, look back at any pandemic, it's not 100%. If the germ theory were true, it would be everybody. That's one of the B.J. Palmer quotes. If the, the, the germ theory were true, no one would, would be alive to talk about it because everyone would get it. And so we have to, like, I'm so interested in the people that don't get it and the people that aren't susceptible. You know, I think that our, our susceptibility to the conflicts of others, to, you know, morphic resonance and resonating with the people around us and mirror neurons and how, you know, being around people who are really afraid versus being around people who are calm and confident and healthy. Follow those people. <laughs> That's what I'm all about. It's like, look at who who is unafraid? Who is calm? Who seems the healthiest? Why, why don't we follow those people? Um, but yeah, back to the, the tuberculosis thing and the bacteria. It's like we take these snapshots. It's everything, everything about disease in modern medicine is taken out of context. We look at something, we see a snapshot, we see cells growing. This is bad. We see bacteria and we say, this is bad. Bacteria is causing this. These cells are growing. And then we get in there and it's so inelegant and it's so ham-handed. I feel like someone going in and saying, oh, there's a, there's a tumor here. I must take it out. And I mean, I feel like it's so arrogant <laughs> to, to think that you know better than the body. And when you look and when you really understand and, you know, thank you to Dr. Dr. Homer for figuring this out, that the bacteria are microsurgeons. They like think about all that a, a surgeon has to go through in order to keep you alive while they're doing surgery, cut through bone and muscle and tissue and all of this stuff to get in there to take out a tumor. Like that is so much work <laughs> when you have these intelligent microbes that are endemic to certain germ layers and they are equipped better than you ever could be to break down and decompose a tumor. Like these are the most brilliant things and here we are killing bacteria, trying to sanitize the body, trying to get rid of the bacteria that are literally the lifesavers, they're literally what are there for specific reasons to remove tumors. And so, I mean, but that is, you know, the history of all of medicine and allopathy is like, oh, I know better. I'm going to get in here and, and do something. But people have gotten sicker and sicker and sicker. Ever since, you know, we've been doing modern medicine, people have been sicker than ever before. That's one of the, like, just the most practical, like, come to Jesus moments, like, look at health right now we must be doing something wrong. We've got more money than ever before, more research, more doctors, more fancy hospitals and schools and all of this, yet people are sicker than ever before. Don't you think it's time to go back to the drawing board? Um, and so looking at this and seeing the intelligence of the microbes and seeing the intelligence of the body and seeing, you know, when you get into, into rhythm and into tune and you like tune into self and you're like, Am I in conflict? Am I, you know, being uh, sucked in by all of this fear? Am is my mind racing at night? You know, like more people than ever before are, you know, they've got insomnia and they're they're anxious and they're depressed and they're worried and they're afraid. And it's like, don't you think that 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 all that that's going on in your mind is communicating something to your body and realizing, oh. All of these things I'm, that are going through my mind, these are all communications and my body's just doing its best to adapt. <laughs> and so a person that has like multiple diagnoses and multiple health issues, it's like your body is literally doing its best to adapt to all that's going on in your mind and you're not experiencing like literal physical threats. I thought it was great what you said earlier, Mike, about just kind of being out there and literally fighting the fire. It's very grounding in a sense because it's a, it's a real physical danger and we have a dearth of real physical physical dangers, real threats in our environment. And so really to not be bored all the time, we have to invent threats and we watch scary movies and we go through all of these, you know, these biochemical, you know, shocks, um, but we're not physically expending. Like if literally, if you had actual physical threats that you were escaping from and then resolving more like an animal in nature, we'd be so much healthier. And that's why 
you know, as far as lifestyle stuff, I think that certain physical uh, feats are very important, like weightlifting, like sprinting, like cold exposure, because it turns your nervous system all the way on. And then we know how to fully engage, fully activate that fight or flight system, and then fully relax. But we're in this kind of mushy middle where people are just chronically heightened sympathetically and their body's constantly adapting to non-existent threats. And so it's getting back to that true fight or flight, that true, let me give my body, you know, something to overcome and then fully relax is so powerful to access healing, um, to access getting back into this kind of primal rhythm with this organism that developed for actual physical threats. And, and once again, the five biological laws explain everything because let's just say somebody has a biological uh, or a conflict in a biological process going on and say it's diagnosed as a cancer. And in the five laws, you understand that it's a biphase. It goes through two predictable phases where the sympathetic system is active. And then in the healing phase, the parasympathetic is more active. And then you come full circle and you're out of the woods. However, everything that you're describing that keeps us in stress is going to maintain phase one of the biological process. And in the event of a cancer or any disease, not just cancers, it's going to keep us then in a hanging conflict so that the biological process cannot move on to the second healing phase so uh, you know you're absolutely right and once again dr. hammer uh, you know with his work uh, proved out you know through evidence that everything we're doing to ourselves is not only acknowledging the body's innate healing properties but also doing everything the opposite to support the body and what it's trying to do in the first place totally and uh, one one of the big things that I, I love to get across and anytime I'm speaking to a group is how you react to symptoms is important because when you start understanding this two phase and that, you know, I was in a conflict, I resolved the conflict, now I'm symptomatic. How you respond to your symptoms is very important because if you're responding to symptoms with, oh no, what's wrong with me? Or, oh, and you, you, you know, <laughs> what is it? You go onto WebMD or you Google and you, and you see, oh my gosh, it could be this, it could be this. And, and what is that? That for many people that you can get a conflict shock from looking at WebMD, <laughs> from looking up a symptom and freaking yourself out. Oh my gosh, do I have, do I have cancer? Is this really bad? And then you go to the doctor and you, you get, you know, your, these tests. I, I do think that the reason that we have more, you know, cancer diagnoses than ever before is because of constant monitoring and constant testing. And we're constantly looking at the blood and we're looking at all of these things and we're saying, oh, this could be a problem. And people are chronically afraid of what their body is doing and they feel so alienated from their body. You know, people being diagnosed with autoimmune, oh, my body's attacking me. And you feel at war, like within your own physical home, when you feel at war with your own flesh, I mean, that's, that's absolutely terrifying. And so to get into rapport with your, with yourself and to realize the symptom is meaningful, the symptom is purposeful. It's here for a reason. Um, when you can trace back and, you know, and, and it really is, it's the self knowledge, self understanding, seeing, oh, you know, this is how my body, this is how I experienced this shock. This is how my body adapted. And this is how my body is repairing itself. And so when you can begin to respond to symptoms, when you have a flare up of pain, when you have a rash, when you have, you know, some type of, um, of symptom, you can see oh, like muscle spasms or muscle weakness. That's a big one too. Um, like with conditions like with MS or ALS, when a person, you know, starts getting symptoms um, in that family, it's very scary because you start looking things up and you start looking at the prognosis, you start looking at what traditionally happens and how it worsens and worsens, and you get this image implanted in your mind and you get so scared. And when you realize, oh, this had to do with a motor conflict, a, moving, a movement conflict where I felt frozen in fear, and my muscles in that moment, the, the, the biology perceived that the best way to help you survive this is to freeze, to paralyze the muscle so that you, there's no movement, so that the predator, whatever you were you know, afraid of, 
thinks, oh, it's dead and it can move on. And the, and the muscles group, muscle groups can do that when you are feeling stuck, when you're feeling frozen in fear. And so to realize that there's a whole biological program here, there's, there's muscle paralysis, the paralysis will extend into the healing phase and then the healing crisis are spasms. You know, so when your body is, is having spasms or even seizures, that's typically we say, oh no, they've got a condition, something's wrong with them. When really that's the end, that, that's the healing crisis. Your body went through the whole program. And so rather than looking at, especially like the, the healing crisis, the epi crisis as something of, oh no, now I'm going to get this scary diagnosis. When you see it's all a part of this program and you're already out of the woods, it brings so much peace. It brings so much understanding. And yes, there are intense healing phases. Yes, there are things where, you know, medical inter intervention can potentially be quite helpful for you to survive that situation. But when you can go through this process with this mentality of this is all purposeful, my body knows what it's doing, and um, it, it just brings peace. You know, panic and fear is the number one accelerator of all disease. Number one thing, because when you're in panic, when you're in fear, your body um, will close off the kidney collecting tubules, which is another biological conflict. Your body starts holding on to water because you are so desperately afraid. And any area of your body that's in healing is going to swell up. It can make tumors seem to grow. It can cause you know, extreme swelling on the brain. And it's that swelling that really adds such a complication to the healing phase. And so that's why <sighs> peace, chill. I always talk about like... And, the uh that it is about helping people chill. <laughs> and maybe that, uh, that holding on to water that in New German medicine we call an existence conflict, which uh, you know, triggers the kidney collecting tubules to hold on to water in the first place. Uh, perhaps that's uh, a big reason why people are showing up with a lot of fluid in the lungs these days. Absolutely. Yeah. Fluid. That's, that's what takes something like a territorial fear conflict that you experience that could lead just to a dry cough. The thing that would advance that into pneumonia. So, you know, as far as the, the upper respiratory type of issues, like, uh, you know, like the flu or like Corona, whatever, it's affecting the, the bronchioles and it could just be a cough. But once you panic, once you're afraid, once you say, oh no, I have this bad thing, once you're in an environment, you know, in addition to existence, isolation, abandonment, refugee, here you are out of your home in isolation, in quarantine. People are saying you've got the worst thing ever. It's so scary. You know, it makes perfect sense that the body's going to hold on to this water. The water's going to go to the lungs and that's going to complicate what could have been just a little, you know, cough that lasted probably a couple of weeks until the body finished the, the healing process into something much more advanced, much more serious um, that, you know, and then obviously we step in and we overstep, and <laughs> we do too much intervention, but yeah, it's that, that water retention is what causes so many conflicts to, to intensify and to become much, much worse than they could be. Exactly. And if you do have a, a multidisciplinary approach, you can accommodate any uh, emergency situations that can arise. You know, back when we had our active clinic, I had a good relationship with the local hospital there. And so we could send people in for, you know, any kind of test that we wanted. And then they just, uh, you know, tell the people to go back to us because we treated most of the people and the staff in the hospital. So they trusted us. And we had all sorts of different doctor types working with us. But for instance, if uh, in the aftermath and healing phase, if the original lesion that was triggering the whole thing by way of the brain, a certain area of the brain, uh, you know, maybe in uh, coincident with uh, kidney collecting tubules holding on to water and you get swelling on the brain, which of course doctors would call a brain tumor or something, then you, you knew what to do. You knew how to monitor it, how to do a uh, certain sort of life preservation things, and including just packing the, the head in ice for a few hours or a day or whatever, just to calm down the swelling and everything till the are out of the woods. And then, uh, you know, very predictably people would go into the final healing phase and come out of the woods. But, you know, it does require, I think, a little bit of a, uh, you know, we have the best of all worlds these days. We have uh, great technologies. The medics do have their place, I believe. You know, I used to work in emergency medicine, and I saw the efficacy of that. It's just that we treat everything, you know, with that same kind of shock and awe approach, which is unfortunate. But if we put all the pieces together, then I mean, we could be enjoying a medical system, the likes of what uh, we've never experienced before. And some of these um, 
concepts that we think are unique to new German medicine have been around for a long time. You know, when I was studying traditional Chinese medicine and in Ayurvedic and all sorts of things, you know, it always talked about the holographic uh, play out of the body of what's going on on different levels of our consciousness. Uh, Dr. Hammer, of course, was the first one to come along and actually create a taxonomy of disease based on that information and also do it based on evidence. So what really excites me these days, and it's you know, where all my uh, work and, and efforts are, are in uh, what you brought up, you know, Walter Russell is one gentleman. I think he did uh, the best job in you know, more contemporaneous times to bring a different awareness to the public in a way where the Western mind could hear it. But there's a lot of other individuals that echoed exactly what he was telling us. So now if you take what Dr. Hammer was doing at the end of his life, which was really exploring the use of sonics and working with musicologists in order to change the electrical vectors that are perhaps creating the conflict in the psyche in the first place to help it you know, regain symmetry on that electrical vector level, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, now all of a sudden you have a whole new vista of possibilities open. And so my bioterrain uh, experience, I've pretty much moved completely into the electrical bioterrain and, you know, and, and all of the, the technologies and, and things that we're doing research and development wise are understanding, you know, that basically our bi biology is a product of those vectors. They do come from us in the first place. The brain, of course, is the physical relay because it's the thing, it's the organ that records, uh, you know, those electrical sensations. But then if we now are ready to go to that next level to um, take responsibility uh, in ourselves for producing those vectors in the first place, then I, I really believe that that's the next level of freedom we'll enjoy beyond what Dr. Hammer was leading us to. Yeah, and that's like the, the work that I'm uh, most interested in is really it's, it's in consciousness and it's in looking at, you know, you and, and tapping in with I am and, and, and realizing that, okay, so how do I how do I prevent, how do I resolve conflicts? How do I prevent conflicts? How do I avoid them? How do I downgrade them if something does happen? And it's in realizing who you really are and realizing that there is no external threat. There is no external danger. And that, you know, it's kind of all this grand play. It's this, you know, these, these projections of our minds. I can create in my mind a feeling of insecurity or anger or jealousy or, you know, territorial anger or this boundary conflict. And I can get involved in the game. You know, it was uh, Alan Watts was really um, huge for me in his work, just kind of awakening me to the the just the seeing that this is all a grand play, and we're we're here playing these roles, and we're in these bodies. You know, these these physical this physical apparatus that has these that plays by these certain laws. But when you really see who you are, and you see um, the power that you do have to transmute and to change and to transform your reality through your consciousness, you start seeing that you know my body doesn't have to take this on. When I'm truly connected with my consciousness and my I am, there is no conflict, and so my body there's nothing to adapt to. You know, it's only when you can't process something with your mind um, that your body takes it on. And so if you can begin to, to expand your concept of self and who you really are and what you can do and realizing that there is no corner you can be backed into, there is no situation, you know, it's all, you know, you've seen the end of the play, you've seen the end of the movie, you know how this goes, I'm going to be okay no matter how things seem right now. And so that's in my work, what I really try to connect people to is that it doesn't matter how things appear right now, how bad things seem, all can be transmuted, all can be transformed. You can access this, this immense freedom, even if you are physically paralyzed, even if you are in a state of extreme, um, you know, constriction because of, you know, the government or, you know, whatever's going on, there is no external danger is kind of the, the biggest picture idea um, that I want to get across to people. Because when you really embody that and you know, there is no external danger, even, you know, getting to that place of such extreme peace, 
that if you encountered a wild animal, that it would walk away, that you wouldn't, you wouldn't be in danger. There wouldn't be a threat. And so I think that that is such a, a cool thing to help people to access. But, you know, some people, one, some people want to play the game. Their, their, their role in this lifetime is to kind of, it's to be in it. <laughs> it's to have the highs and the lows and the drama and the loss and the, uh, and, the uh. and, and so, you know, if, if some people want to play that game, it's like, that's cool. Keep playing, like do your thing. That's, that's, that's what we're here for. It's just for variety of experience. But for those who are like, I want, I want to experience the bigness while still in this, you know, this physical form. Um, I believe there's so much that can be done. There's so many fun tools and that's, what my partner and I have done, we've created um, dozens of courses that take the, the biological conflicts and we show you ways of thinking about them differently, interacting um, with your, your reality in a new and different way and breaking free so that things that happen to you, traumas that have happened in the past, that you can transmute and use it and kind of creating that state of anti-fragility where you know, you're not broken by things that happen. You, you are made better. You are made stronger and more resilient. And so that's kind of the mentality that I help the people that I work with to embody that I'm okay no matter what. And I, you know, I can process and transmute this mentally so my body doesn't have to take it on. And uh, I, I love it uh, that you said the two magic words, which is I am, because anything that we follow I am with is just an overlay and it's really fictional. Uh, I am, of course, is the English translation of Om, which is the recognition of the universal Godhead or intelligence, however you want to think about it. So, um, you know, I, I really think this process is a bit of a detoxification process in that what we're detoxifying is our belief systems that create those overlays and the exact electrical vectors that create the prism that that energy coming through the top of our head every single moment that animates our biology in the matrix in the first place has to go through that, you know, that prism, which is colored. You're going to create all the hues and things uh, according to our belief system. So as we lose those attachments, as we lose those belief systems and that light can come through without having to bend so much, then, uh, then that I am is simply going to manifest in our original perfected state. And uh, I don't hear people using that terminology too much these days. So delighted that you're going there as well. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and getting to that, I love, um, because it was through you guys in your podcast that I heard of Walter Russell and started seeing, um, his, his work in the, the rhythmic balance interchange and stillness and how stillness is, is, is from where everything comes is back to that stillness. And so when you can embody stillness within you and you can access that kind of one mind consciousness and, and access all of that, that is that is conflict free you know there's no more of that split energy there's no more of that you know you're you're seeing yourself in this in this play and things can go wrong and you can get hurt and people outside of you when you realize that everything all exists at once and there's just kind of this one energy and we're here having this this experience right now that that bigness that ability to zoom out i find is so important for resolving conflicts is the to see everything from this new perspective from this biggest vision um the work of neville goddard is really i find very um links up very well with walter russell and and his stuff is really helpful because it's imagination it's like can you imagine your way out of this can you use your imaginative fa faculty to see a solution to this problem and and realizing that that is creating the blueprint is that we do we just get stuck in these patterns we get stuck in expectations we think very linear that this has to happen and this has to happen if you've got a big problem like if you've got a financial situation that you're like you you know you're in a conflict you're you're worried about your existence you're worried about your finances you're worried about being able to feed your children you're like panicked and you only are thinking in this linear way like this would have to happen and this would have to happen and you're like you know and then there's this voice of doubt none of that stuff can happen and so it makes sense that you're just laying in bed awake at night just so wracked with fear but when you access this consciousness you zoom out you realize you, you connect yourself with the i am you dissolve all of the problems all of the issues and you devise in your mind and you imagine a solution and you embody what it would feel like if that solution came to be it's like you are programming reality 
And when you start seeing that that, you know, life is a video game and you get to program what comes next. But if you're not conscious of how you're programming things and you're just reflexively doing it how your parents did it and how society does it, you're going to get what society gets and what your parents got and the things that you learned were facts of the matter and the truth about the world. They're just your truth about the world. They're how you are choosing to see things. And it is so hard for some people to break out of that very materialistic and linear physical model, but some people are so ready for it. And they're like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. I'm going to give it a go. Um, and those that are uh, willing to play in that realm, they reap the rewards and they have start having so much more fun with their experience. It's like, if you can't see it in your mind's eye, you, you can't create it. But if you can see it in your mind's eye, you can easily create it. Because everything, you know, it's just, none of this stuff really exists. It's all, you know, it's all zeros and ones. It's all programming. It's all light. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, relating back to the idea of fear. And I, and I do have some amazing questions here that people are in the chat are loving this discussion, by the way. Um, but just relating this quickly back to my life, you know, we, we have fires everywhere. And uh, right now, our, our town was evacuated last Wednesday with impending fire and it was really stressful getting a call at six in the morning, you know, evacuate now kind of thing. And we were kind of prepped for it, but um, I'm driving all my stuff down to town. My family was already evacuated and I put on the local news and it was fear, fear, fear. It was, you know, with a positive little note to their voice, but it was really driving fear because they were giving misinformation that the fire making it sound like it was already in our town. And um, and things like that. And I could start to feel my, uh, my heart beating really fast and my throat kind of closing up a little bit. And I thought, oh, maybe it was the smoke inhalation and, um, you know, uh, going to that idea of physicality, material stuff causing it. And really what it was, was me, you know, from the fear reaction. And what was funny is once I decided to rejoin the fire department and come up here and take action myself and defend the town and really get involved, all of that dissipated. And I was in the mo moment and I was there with my, you know, fellow firefighters activating, you know, you know, ourselves and getting in action and it all dissipated and that throat thing went away and I felt great. So just a little experience for myself just happening last week, kind of going through that. Um, yeah, it was really, really interesting. Um, I do have a, a really good question from Dr. Edith Ubuntu Chan, who is in the chat. It's so wonderful having her in here. And um, she, uh, this is kind of relating back to the pandemic and, and oh, excuse me, the pandemic or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is kind of a cool question. Um, she was asking, um, what's the relationship between, uh, with our individual personal consciousness and psyche with the collective consciousness and psyche of all of humanity? That That's a good sense. question. Um, I think that the the individual is what matters most. And like, I think some individuals can be more susceptible to the collective than others. I believe that people who kind of have that sense of personal responsibility and they are rooted in, in kind of self in I am, that they are less susceptible to the, the collective. Um, and I do think that there are other people that are more in tune with the collective and that can they they can resonate with that fear and they can it can spread very easily to them because they don't have that kind of individuated sense of i am and actually this kind of gets into a little bit of just collectivism in general um you know i i was uh, several years ago i started reading ayn rand and really just understanding just like the collectivist mind is 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 no mind it's no individual it's no i am it's your kind of merged and melded with with all and everything else and you're supposed to be you know empathic and you're supposed to you know feel pain for other people and in a, in a sense, I feel like that that creates a society that is more susceptible to pandemics, to mass fear, to mass conflict and adaptation, um, because you feel obligated to take on the burdens of everyone else and the fears of everyone else. And you, you say, well, who am I? Like, it's a little old me syndrome. You know, who am I to have my own thoughts, my own beliefs? And so we kind of merge and meld with the collective. And so I think the only way to kind of the, the useful form of uh, collective consciousness has to come through the individual. It can't come through you just dissolving yourself and, and molding and melding with whatever happens to be around you. It comes from you individuating 
realizing the I am in you. And then through that, you see how everything's connected. And so I think that there, there's kind of a, an order that things have to go in in order for you to really usefully merge with the collective and, and use collective consciousness. But if it's from this place of dissolution and I don't, you know, who am I to, you know, it's for the party, it's for the group, it's for the collective, um, um, and you sacrifice self, I believe that that is anti-life. I think that that is against the individual. And I believe that that does lead to greater adaptation and, and sickness of a society. And so that's kind of how I see it. Um, it. That's what makes sense to me. That's how I have, you know, feel like I can usefully merge with the collective and help collective consciousness. It's only through I am. It's through my own personal connection. Well, that's a, that's the whole purpose of individualization in the first place. Uh, you know, otherwise there'd be no reason for it. <clears throat> and if we didn't um, come here and do our job, which is basically to see things through a very particular perspective to add to the universal consciousness, and if instead we succumb to the, the collective mind, uh, you know, it goes back to decentralization. We're finding that uh, with every facet of our lives, we need to decentralize. So if, if we fail to maintain our individuality and, uh, and our own perspective and take on the collective mindset, then there's, it really defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do here in the first place or why we even embodied as an individual in the first place. So, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with what you say. Another great question we had too, and you were touching on this, Melissa, was um, from Joe Mill was, um, what type of other therapies does GNM offer uh, in terms of uh, resolving, in terms of the psyche influence? And um, is it just enough to kind of have an understanding of the conflict and healing cycle? Or are there specific modalities at play and specific therapeutics offered uh, to help with that? So within GNM, you know, it's a science, you know, this is the science, the five biological laws. Um, there are no specific therapeutic interventions um, that are prescribed by, by the five biological laws in and of themselves. So, but once you know them, there are so many different interventions and it's a very, it's very unique. It's extremely individual and subjective. So what it's going to take for one person to resolve their conflict is going to be different than another person. And so um, practitioners or consultants or uh, counselors or therapists, people who use the five biological laws in their work, there's so many different modalities that people will use. Some will use EFT, matrix re-imprinting, EMDR. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's the list is endless. It's really anything. I think that anything that takes a person um, from a state of um, I'm not okay to I'm okay. And so what that's going to take for an individual in their unique situation is going to, is going to vary. And so my work in what I do is, is mostly through consciousness. It's through connecting to um, the bigger vision and to, to seeing how you can transmute and transform and access your imagination to resolve um, any conflict. And so, um, but that may not work for everybody. Some people like a little more of like physical interaction or somatic work to, to, to help to, to discharge or they'll want to use some type of intervention or something to help with their, their brainwave frequencies or, you know, so there's no specific there. The list is endless. It's really anything that helps you to make sense out of um, calming your nervous system, feeling a sense of okayness, feeling a sense, I find, of, of empowerment, you know, because when you think of an organism, again, what would cause it to adapt when it's feeling weak, when it's fe feeling powerless, when it's feeling vulnerable. Um, but the bigger you make yourself in consciousness and the more empowered you feel and the less vulnerable you feel to the things, the external things that happen. And so really it's what, what brings you empowerment. I think working out <laughs> is extremely helpful for resolving conflicts. When I feel physically strong, when I feel like I could, you know, I can, I can do, I can do a pull up. I can sprint a mile. I could get out of any physical situation. I think that physical cultivation is extremely impo important for resolving conflicts, but is it the only thing? Not at all. It's, it's definitely, um, you know, a whole holistic system of I'm doing things that make sense to me. I'm feeling strong. I am, you know, going after the things that, that I, that I'm passionate about. I'm, uh, you know, like it's really life improvement overall can help resolve conflicts. And so, um, those are just some of the things that I know of and that I've used. Yeah. As, as practitioners, a lot of times we get overly invested in the tools that we've acquired, you know, in our practice. And, 
I, I let go of that a long time ago. I don't believe there's any best way. I don't believe, uh, you know, naturopathy is better than this or that or acupuncture better than osteopathy. It's just, uh, you know, I came to recognize when a person ended up on my doorstep, there's a reason for it. I had a certain perspective. I had a certain life experience that carries uh, an energy field with it. And if people came, were attracted to my energy field, then it's like, okay, obviously, you know, they're getting something out of this. Otherwise, they wouldn't even show up in the first place. But I think it's real important as practitioners to kind of lose that whole uh, engagement as far as being overly invested in what we do or a best way or the only way to do things in the first place. Yeah, I was, I was definitely in the dogma camp for a really long time. Like I grew up very, you know, I had my, my views were very fixed for 25 years. <laughs> and so I have this ability to, to become very dogmatic. And my awareness of that has helped me tremendously because, you know, it is, it's so easy to kind of get locked into the way. <laughs> like Mike earlier, when you said that thing about your mom, that was me. Every, every break when I <laughs> came from Atlanta to Michigan to, uh, to come home to my family, I literally would throw everything out of their, their cupboards I'd throw all of the junk food away. I'd go to Whole Foods and buy new stuff. I'd lecture everyone. Every holiday I'm giving them, you know, Grain Brain was one that gives everybody that book. And, um, and I was very much like, you guys are, you're, you're every, I told my dad, every time you eat this ice cream, you know, do you want to see your grandkids? You're, you're poisoning yourself. And, and so that, that was me. I was like hardcore. And I thought I was doing the right thing because here they are, they're just doing, you know, they're killing themselves. And little did I know I'm like laying this ginormous guilt trip on these people. And I'm being very insufferable about my views and this is right. And that's wrong. And so, um, I had, several huge wake up calls in my life seeing, you know, that, you know, my prescription, my way of doing things was not the way it was a way, but, but that knowing that there's just so many different paths has been very helpful for me in engaging, you know, with friends and family. The Gandhi uh, peace doctrine, you know, all the masters and ascended masters and Jesus, that really seems to be the ultimate route to go for complete health is just trying to stay away from conflict as much as we can. Um, so if you feel that bubbling up of ego where you need to tell a loved one, hey, um, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, maybe instead just approach it with love and, and maybe give a little bit of your insight, but accept who they are. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, right? It's a definitely a challenge with ego constantly. And it's a, definitely an internal personalized journey. But one thing I try to do is with my kids is always um, teach through action and, and through who I am and what I do, not what I say. And so I feel like we're all, if we can all kind of um, really embrace that, that master's um, philosophy of, of the, uh, of, you know, the uh, living in peace and harmony and, and, and that centered, that centered, you know, kind of quiet that we, you were mentioning the stillness that like Walter Russell discusses, which is really all the great masters talk to the Buddha, Jesus, um, you know, everybody that was always the central theme. And it's, it seems so simple, but trying to do it all day long is difficult because of ego and because of our programming and because that we are born into this world of conflict and war on everything. So in a way it's really simple, but also it, it's, it takes a lot of work. And I do love how you say it's all about passion, right? It's all about, we talk about this a lot. It's like your hero's journey, going out and enjoying your life and finding what you love to do and, and, and finding that passion. If you look at truly successful people, that's what they're really good at. And it's like waking up and jumping out of bed and being excited for the day and then having a plan and working on yourself, keeping a journal, going into, you know, doing breath work, working out. Um, finding your passions and it's a lot of just self-help stuff in the end, but um, it's, uh, it's really empowering because it doesn't take money. It doesn't take going out and buying programs or diets. It's really just um, really just doing the work on your own self. Yeah. One of the big things, something that really does help resolve conflicts is having something better to think about. You know, a lot of people, they, they get stuck in kind of this holistic health hamster wheel and they're just like going to the next summit, doing the next, you know, they're trying to heal and fix themselves. And it's like getting off of that. It's like finding something else. And that's where 
you know, I think that homesteading and things like that are so profound because there's like this actual need, like you actually need to do something because we're so provided for, because everything can be delivered to our doorstep and we never have to go anywhere or lift a finger to, to create, you know, food <laughs> and sustenance and survival that everything can be done through the computer basically. We don't have any of these, you know, act, actual like physical things to engage with. We don't have anything better to think about than our problems. And so it's like when, when some kind of big thing happens, like people out actually fighting fires, it's like that in and of itself could resolve someone's conflict because it's like, I have a purpose. <laughs> I have something very practical, very useful that I can take my, my consciousness in, in, and focus it on. And so looking in your own life, it's like, do I have some something better to think about, some, some kind of passion project, something I'm lit up about, something I want to bring forth into the world, something I'm trying to create. Um, and that in and of itself could be the, the key for you in resolving your conflict is just kind of stop focusing on it. Get your mind off of having problems and trying to fix problems and reading another book and taking in more information. People are just, we're overloaded with, with information. And we, you know, we don't have kind of practical things that we're doing each day that, that really fulfill us, that are fun for us. And so, uh, thinking about that could be very helpful for some people. So Melissa, um, how do you work these days? Uh, do you just have more of a local practice or do you do a lot of work from afar with people, you know, that live remote from you? How can they find you and, and what would they expect, uh, you know, uh, if they contacted you? Yeah, all my work is online currently. Um, and I may do some type of office situation just because I do love seeing people in person. I really do love adjusting people too. <laughs> I, I love, I love getting adjusted. I love adjusting. It's a really, you know, wonderful, fulfilling thing. That's just not what I'm doing currently. Everything's online. Um, I have a lot of online courses. And so if you're kind of more self-guided, the courses are really wonderful. They um, give you a million tools really is that that's just what we were just throwing out tools. My partner and I, we like different, we call it, you know, like thought technology, ways of working around, transforming the way that you are processing information, the way you're thinking about yourself and accessing, you know, new states, new, new places within you uh, where conflict can't exist. So, um, so there's courses. I also do one-on-one -on -one work. Um, anyone is welcome to set up a free 15 minute call. I love the 15 minute calls. We just get to chat a little bit about what you've got going on to figure out if this path is right for you, if one of the courses. And then I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is um, really fun. I just, I love talking to people. And um, the thing that I find has helped me the most as far as being a coach for people is having coached myself through a lot, you know, and it's, it's like tools that I use every single day to transform my experience. Cause like you said, Mike, it's an ongoing thing to access that balance and to access that peace and to realize there are no problems. And when you kind of abide in that, we have a lot of exercises and tools that we try to you know, teach and impart to people of how do you bring this from the idea realm into like the practical experience realm. And I do think that we, we have a lot of ways of really helping people to connect with the realness of, creating that peace in this moment, noticing what am I thinking about? What am I focusing on? How am I focusing on it? How am I using my mind to create this, this inner picture? How is that making me feel? You know, how is this expressing in my behavior? What, you know, results and feedback am I getting from my environment? And it's really just kind of having a million inroads into your experience and, and building a million mental pathways back to peace. You know, so it's like, if I can go from a state, and that's the thing is we can't prevent conflict. We can't prevent shocking things from happening. That is like part of life. Part of the <laughs> surprise button, which is being in this physical form, is that unexpected stuff is going to happen. And it's my ability to recognize and transform, to see, Ooh, I'm freaking out right now. Okay, what am I thinking about? How am I focusing on this? Is there, do I have access to another way of thinking about this? Is this the only way? You know, what would bring me more peace right now? What would, what idea, what thing could happen that would allow me to go from the state of I'm not okay to this is okay, this is handleable. You know, what can I do mentally to shrink this problem down and make myself big? Um, and so those are some of the tools that I really like try to connect people with so that they can transform and just feel confident moving through the world knowing that I got this, like that feeling of, I've got this, I've got this handled, and not even just me in my physical form, but I'm hooked up with all of the wisdom of the universe, you know, and knowing that at any moment, you have access to all of the wisdom of the universe. And that's, you know, something I love so much about all of this work, is it's not 
held by the ascended masters and it's not you know given to you in latin so that you can't understand it and you know it's it's, it's held by the the sacred holy people and the sacred holy doctors and they've got all the information and here i am i lay myself prostrate before you please help me uh savior <laughs> and that's what we do in so many regards we think that someone outside of us has the information and that we need to to do the things and go through you know their holy rites in order to access it and when you realize you have access to that power every moment of every day for your entire existence and right here and right now you can access it you can create peace within your body you can transform and call forth from the universe any material goods that you need can be provided for you. And when you just like open yourself up to even believing that, because again, some people were so materialistic, we're so logical, we're so rational and, and, and reasonable, and we are looking at the facts and we're, you know, and you kind of have to get a little weird with it. You gotta have to kind of break out of some of that hyper rationality and realize that you know the the supernatural is a part of every single moment and it's not just fantasy like our whole entire existence if you get weird enough and you zoom in close enough you'll see there's nothing solid here there's nothing real <laughs> everything is in flux everything is this this transmuted and transformed light and your ability to tap into that i mean that's that's what i do <laughs> that's what i try to do <laughs> in my coaching is help people to to get weird with it to to break out of Ment rigid mental boxes and ways of thinking and dogma and our expectations and our beliefs about ourselves and the world and other people and start seeing things from a new and different way that can just bring the sense of chill, calm, peace, relaxed, all as well. I've got this kind of vibe. Yeah, I, th I think the cat's out of the bag. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are really concerned about the powers that be and you can't fight city hall and who am I? I'm just a little guy. And, and we're all concerned about those things. But, um, you know, right now, uh, you know, every truth that we need to know is, is like you say, right within us. We don't need an outer conduit. We don't need permission. Uh, we can just download anything we want at any time. We don't have to earn it. You know, that's another thing we've all been taught. Uh, it, no, it's our divine right. You don't have to earn a darn thing. <clears throat> and we are the the universal consciousness and we're here to individualize that so uh you know it's just absolutely brilliant and i think um you know technology actually will play a, a good uh part in moving forward here just like dr Hammer, i think was the missing link in medicine um walter russell i look at as a missing link in the world of physics and, and science in that he was able to bring evidence-based uh, information about you know how this in fact is a thought-based universe and you're the creator of your own reality just like Dr. Homer made the link between the mind and the psyche and uh, you know we're having a lot of fun these days because we're actually using instrumentation that is not just a technological version that we think of as instrumentation these days but it actually has the ability to address or measure very accurately qualitative aspects of reality whereas you know up to this time our technology has been cut in half and and it just brings us a quantitative part but that qualitative aspect is is very important and what would really surprise people is that you can measure that and then that will give you complete access to some of these things we're talking about like where those original conflicts are are you know um, you know uh, you know being perpetuated at the level of consciousness and how we can actually interact technologically but we're not just relying on a technology outside of ourselves because these qualitative based technologies actually create a need for us to interact it's not just a machine doing something for us from the outside and then of course in order to just use these technologies in the first place you have to entertain the idea that we are pure consciousness and we are in the driver's seat and now we're using technology to enhance that rather than to do it for us so that's where i see you know we're moving forward that's the future by bio, bioterrain medicine as far as I'm concerned, you know, right now I'm training with uh, different people overseas that have really made great advances in, in this kind of technology and interacting and literally uh, bending um, thought waves and that sort of thing in order to create the reality that we want. So, yeah, it, it's just immensely exciting times and, uh, and it's just so wonderful to see, again, people in your generation taking it the next step. How are we doing out there in the peanut gallery? Any more questions, Mike? 
Um, well, no, I, I mean, there's, there's a few more questions, but nothing super pressing. Actually, what I wanted to say on that bear too with Melissa, because that was the reason why I was so excited to have her on because she really is a great example of the awakening happening. And someone, you know, she's a younger generation than me. It's like the next gen. Um, but, you know, I really feel like- You're old, I'm, Mike. I am, dude, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm an x gener, dude. I'm like the last of the x geners, man. <laughs> Um, but, but that, being I see the gray in your beard. Yeah. I'm not even take my hat off, bro. Uh, <laughs> but, but that being said, we are moving towards consciousness technology, right? We're moving towards where science, medicine, social, um, connectivity is moving towards a conscious technology where right now we're still really entrapped in the physicality of materialism. But I really believe that analog consciousness based technology will be the future new german medicine will play a massive role walter russell type technology will play a massive role and we will get out of the trap of the simulacrums of the zeros and ones that is the um the manufactured ego the ego manufactured technology that we have right now that is from the part of the control matrix and we will be released into our the true biology the biological um you know technology that we have that you were saying that this ancient technological thing that we're in which is way more powerful and amazing than any machine we can create and embracing that and waking up to our our higher consciousness our ability to do things like you know leave our bodies through astral projection having psychic connections bending spoons as uh melissa and i've been doing uh, on a workshop with our minds and um you know, I told a story on that class how I was able to do some really powerful um, mental work with the fires here and suppress that. I really believe, you know, with, with our community, and I want to give a massive shout out to our community, by the way, who's really been supportive during this time where, you know, we, we thought we were on an evacuation notice at the farm. And Bear and Deb were out there spraying down our, our crop and everything as ash was raining down. And there was a lot of uh, a worry about a fire coming through, through the farm. And our community really rallied together on Telegram and Discord and, and, uh, and really put out that light of consciousness to, you know, and sent those great, amazing thoughts. And that has power. That's real. And I really feel we had a kind of a miraculous turn of weather. We had these crazy eastern winds that were taking this, this fire right towards us. It had crossed something, some crazy amount of acreage overnight, and it was looking pretty dire. And, and you know, within a day and a half of sending this love and light and these great thoughts, we had a miraculous change of the weather, and the fire, you know, turned its tail. And I really believe that stuff. And it's really what Dr. Lando would bear always – really pushes forward on this podcast is our belief systems are everything. And if we have a belief system that's ingrained with current systems of germ theory and the, and the war on everything, we will do war on ourselves and we will manifest illness. We will manifest these symptoms. So it's just so important moving forward that we, that we keep this all in mind and we work together as a community. And that being said, we do have an amazing community on Telegram. Um, you can access that and join us there at t.me forward slash Alpha Vedic. Melissa's in that. Um, wonderful people are in that community. You can also join us on Discord at alphavedic.com forward slash Discord. And those are digital communities. And we do use these technologies, of course, for, for the greater good because we live in a dualistic reality where there's good and, you know, and everything. So please join us there. We do have an amazing event coming up where uh, uh, Dr. Melissa will be speaking at. So if you're interested in that, we are so excited about that. And you can find out more in our, in our Telegram group about that. And uh, yeah, it's just, um, it's just been such a pleasure. I, this discussion has really hit home for us because it's really one of our, the main things we always talk about. Um, any parting words for our community, Melissa? Um, and I'm hoping maybe you can hang on just for five minutes after for our Patreons. Maybe you could, uh, for our Patreons, uh, go through a quick little coaching tip that you might give, if you don't mind, hate to put you on the spot here, but that would be really amazing. Um, but Anything that you could offer um, right now, just uh, words of advice or parting words for the community listening? Yeah, for everybody, it is, you know, connecting with peace. You know, how, how connected are you? How rooted? How grounded? 
you know, are you accessing that every single day and realizing that, you know, there is no outside danger that, you know, it all comes down to you and looking and scanning yourself and really, I think radical self-honesty is, is a very important aspect of, of this work. It's being willing to see how have I been de deceiving myself? How have I been believing things about myself that aren't true and, and perpetuating that idea? And so having that just kind of these moments with yourself of what, what, what about myself do I need to see? And then trusting your subconscious mind, you know, even with resolving conflicts, if it's something, you know, this is all work that you can do on your own, you know, that you don't need anybody else. It's letting your subconscious mind deliver to you, like body, show me, show me what I need to resolve and then listen, you know, so much we're asking, asking, asking for answers, but we, um, we don't spend as much time listening and kind of allowing ourselves to receive. And so find that moment today, you know, check if there's something that you're needing, something that you're wanting, if there's something you've been struggling with, ask, and then be silent, like really experience some deep stillness within your mind and within your body and, and see what comes and trust that something will come, you know, and notice if there's a voice in your mind that's like, this is stupid, you know, this doesn't work, this is just, you know, because that managing that voice is part of the biggest, <laughs> the biggest uh, part of the work that I do is how do you deal with the doubt thoughts? How do you deal with the fear thoughts? How do you deal with that inner voice of, you know, I call it the fact checker, you know, cause it's got a vision of yourself. It's got a vision of your world. And it's, it's like the Facebook fact checker. It is biased. Um, you know, it's, it's built out of early life trauma and bad things you saw happening. And so if you're checking everything in your reality against that voice, you know, you're going to stay where you are until you start questioning that voice and saying, who are you? <laughs> is this really true? What is my life like if I continue believing this? It's the Snopes cat lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Dr. Melissa Sell.com for her coursework and her information. We'll put that link, of course, in the show notes, but that's doc, Dr. Melissa Sell.com, a wonderful, beautiful website, by the way. So you can check that out there. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Also, speaking of Dr. Uh, Edith Abunto Chan, um, we are uh, working with her on a 2020 consciousness training course that we're going to launch. I'll uh, drop that in Telegram today. And that's something she's offering to the broader Alpha Vedic community. So um, if you're interested in expanding on these ideas that we're talking about today, I mean, this directly all relates to that. Um, she has different classes about inner clarity and truth, a higher level of communication, spoon bending with your mind, remote sensing, future vision. Uh, that uh, I will drop in on all our channels and stuff. And um, I look actually forward to having you back on. Uh, Melissa, because I'd like to get into stuff like previous life trauma. I don't know if you go there, reincarnation stuff, more spiritual stuff, kind of the trippier stuff that we love to talk about, more Walter Russell stuff. So I, I think we can have lots more conversation on all this. And we didn't even get through all the five biological laws, really. Um, but at this event coming next month, too, we're going to have a lot of face-to-face -face time, which is going to be really special. And um, for those interested um, in learning more and meeting uh, Melissa, that's something to look into. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And um, once again, yeah, as we always say, get outside. If you have a garden, get your hands dirty in that, go for a hike. Mother nature really is uh, the most amazing thing for helping us get reconnected. Thanks everyone. Have a beautiful day. Love you. And we'll see you next Thursday on DLive, dlive.tv forward slash Alpha Vedic. And of course, this show will be on on YouTube at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and as a podcast everywhere where you can listen to podcasts. And if you do need more information on us, if you're not familiar with us, it's your first time listening, you can go to alphavedic.com. We released our new Illumin line to great acclaim so far with our community. Everyone's loving it, Dr. Lando. So great work there, sir. Um, all that hard work's really paying off. Um, I'm wearing our Illumin shirt. Um, I kind of do a little my own customization, but use your illumination shirt that Brian Lando put together that we abs I absolutely love now. And I've got, uh, I love this shirt. So um, anyways, uh, check that out. And, uh, Go ahead, speaking Brian. of spoon bending, we have uh, in the line, in the clothing line, we have a spoon bending t-shirt that's going to be out someday in the future. I love that one. It's, it's awesome.
Yeah. Does it, what's it say? The spoon bends itself or I, what's the, I forgot. Yeah, that. It's, it's great though. Great graphics, great everything. And we also have a big Lebowski shirt coming out. Well, it's referencing that um, about the electric universe. And that was something I was thinking about when you were talking, Melissa, he's a kind of a good archetype because he just kind of cruises through the dude, man, the dude abides. Right. And in that co brilliant Coen brothers movie, um, all this crazy stuff's happening. He's in this caper and there's all these crazy characters from nihilist to uh, big time industrialist. And he's kind of the calm in the storm, right? He's the, he's just the dude who's just kind of cruising through and he's a great hero to look, look towards. So we have a really fun shirt uh, like that coming out too. So anyways, guys, uh, how, <laughs> yeah, dudisms are the best. Um, Hey, everyone. Have a great day. Love you. And um, we'll see you next week. Cheers.